and welcome one and all to the 31 days of Felissa Rose here on Morbid Moonlight. My name is Alex and I am here to guide you through the filmography of the one and only Felissa Rose, one film at a time with a new video, uh, a new review, every day throughout the month of October. If you want to stay up to date with this whole thing, then please consider subscribing, that would be fantastic. If not, then thanks for stopping by anyway. So, obviously, I'm not going to be able to watch every single horror film that Felicia Rose has ever done, but I will be doing my best to hit the highlights so that hopefully we can build up an idea of Felicia Rose's career, because after all she is a much-loved personality within the world of horror filmmaking, and somebody that I think maybe a lot of people don't know as much about as they should, considering the amount of stuff that she's been in. If you are a die-hard Felissa Rose fan, then that is brilliant, we can share the love together. If you've never even heard of her, then hopefully this whole thing might just be a little bit educational, and hopefully a little bit fun as well. If you're totally unfamiliar with her work, then all you need to know for the moment is that Felissa Rose is an actress who would go on to become a horror icon, thanks to her part in the film that we're going to be talking about today, which is 1983's Sleepaway Camp. And that's where we're going to start things off today, because, hey, it's the perfect place to start. Felissa Rose's first ever acting role, and the one that would secure her a place in the Horror Hall of Fame. So, let's get stuck into this then, all the way back to 1983. Felissa Rose Esposito is 13 years old, and just gearing up to take on her first ever acting job as the shy young heroine uh, Angela of director Robert Hiltzig's summer camp slasher film, and taking this one small seemingly insignificant part would go on to change Felissa Rose's life forever. Without Sleepaway Camp, there would be no Felissa Rose, plain and simple, and that's pretty interesting in itself. When she first accepted the role of Angela, Felissa Rose was this complete unknown, but after the film was finished, she would forever be known as Angela from Sleepaway Camp, which really does speak to just what a level of love and affection there was from audiences towards this film, and to Felissa Rose's performance in particular. But we'll come back to that aspect in just a minute, because first, I want to chat a little bit about some kind of general points about the film. First up, I should say that by some weird quirk of fate, I've never actually seen Sleepaway Camp before, even though I have seen dozens and dozens of its contemporaries, maybe even hundreds, including um, really obscure, weird slashers at the time. For whatever reason, I've just never gotten around to watching Sleepaway Camp before, which means that this is, of course, a first-time watch for me. So what you're getting here is just some kind of initial impressions, rather than this big spiel about um, how I grew up with the film and how I've always loved it. I've kind of had slight reservations, I have to admit, about it in the past, which is probably why I haven't actually got around to watching it. Just because from what I know about it, it's one of those teen slashers that's got kind of a whodunit flavour to it, and that is very much the case. Sleepaway Camp is probably more so than a slasher film, a teen film, in that it's about this group of um, actually quite uh, legit younger kids goofing about and having a good time at a summer camp with a lot of comedy and kind of horseplay and even a few romantic elements thrown in. Now, this is fine if you like those kind of films. However, for me, a lot of the teen films of that period, I've never really cared for those films, to be honest. There's just something about the kind of slightly obnoxious warts and all, aren't all kids just foul-mouthed, sex-obsessed little cunts type of film. There's just a genre that I don't kind of relate to that much now, or back when I was actually the age of the characters in this film. Now, I realise that that is a personal quirk, and not so much a legit criticism of the film itself, I just wanted to hit that up front so that you can either say, yeah, I get that, or you can realise that you feel exactly the opposite way. The point is, a good deal of Sleepaway Camp follows less the formula of a slasher film than it does that of the teen film of the period, so if you like your early 80s teen uh, movies about young teens swearing and being slightly obnoxious in a supposedly amusing way, then there's a lot of Sleepaway Camp that you'll like. For me, though, it's the stuff that gets in the way of the slashery goodness, and that's the important thing about Sleepaway Camp, though, that I think maybe quite a lot of people actually forget. It's easy for us, in this day and age when stuff is constantly being made that kind of actively seeks out and targets niche demographic groups that have proven their worth, you just need to take a look at the biggest film franchise in the world, uh, The Avengers. Nowadays we get films like Infinity War being made that rather than needing to actually pitch itself wide and try and attract this general audience, those films can afford to really go hard on all the intricate lore and mythology of the Marvel Universe because it's got to the point where all the normies are kind of being roped in and converted to the Marvel brand, that you can get away with making a film that basically almost entirely meaningless to somebody that's never watched a Marvel film before, and it still does fucking crazy money at the box office, which is because there's already that proven audience for that kind of thing, and the filmmakers don't need to worry about having to compromise their films to make sure not to alienate the casual audience. 
But back in the 80s, especially for a really low budget film like Sleepaway Camp, your best bet was to try and make a film that would appeal to the widest possible audience instead of just strapping your consumers into this um, kind of sausage factory production line and feeding them a stream of product. In the case of a film like Sleepaway Camp, that meant creating something that looked like a few different sorts of films at the time, the teen comedy and or the slasher film, which meant that distributors could basically um, pick up Sleepaway Camp and then choose how they wanted to market it because it was kind of half one thing and half another. But basically, here's the thing about Sleepaway Camp, and I need to just tell it like it is for a moment. I know it's this hugely revered, genuine kind of cult classic of its time. It's fondly, vividly remembered as this defining point in the history of horror. This real kind of little standout gem, once seen, never forgotten. And I've got to say it, it just doesn't work for me. Or rather, it didn't work for me. And that was a problem, because I just didn't feel Sleepaway Camp, and that really bugged me. But the thing is, it's a film that's not some pretentious piece of critic bait or some kind of artsy crap. Sleepaway Camp is a film made by a bunch of largely inexperienced people doing something that they felt very passionate about. This hugely quirky kind of individual thing that really carries its own kind of weird authorial voice. It doesn't feel like this cynical cash-in or just a kind of going through the motions Friday the 13th clone. It doesn't have a cast full of tired TV hacks or a director for hire who doesn't really feel the whole thing. Sleepaway Camp is an independent little passion project that's 100% the film that it totally wants to be, and it's from that golden early 80s period. When you look at it on paper, it's basically everything that I personally really like in films. Something that's genuine and heartfelt and with that real kind of rough and ready indie energy to it. And that's where the idea that it's a film that's full of teen comedy comes in, and here's why I think Sleepaway Camp became such a success. Basically, I do think that nostalgia is a big part of it, but then I also think that there's literally hundreds of films from this period that are fondly remembered by people who saw them at the time that I still think are fantastic. And I'd never once say that a film like um, Halloween or Phantasm is only still talked about today because of nostalgia. They're considered classics today because they are fucking magisterially brilliant horror films oozing with atmosphere and style and flair that really evoke their own specific time and place, but are also really timeless. But Sleepaway Camp is fundamentally, I think, a horror film that's pitched for normies. Now that's a bit of a sneery word, I have to admit, but what I mean is that it's a horror film that's more or less designed for a very casual audience, as opposed to one that's very much created with that hardcore horror audience in mind. In the same way that films like um, Prom Night were designed to fuse this kind of more uh, female-friendly film genre, which in that case was the disco film, with uh, a horror film, or more specifically a slasher film, in the hopes of pitching itself to that wider audience demographic, Sleepaway Camp is also a clear hybrid film that devotes at least about 60-70% to of its running time to summer camp hijinks, and the rest to kills and more typical kind of slasher stuff. It's what I think you could rightly call a gateway horror film in that it probably brought in a lot of that teen comedy audience of the early 80s and gave them their first taste of horror. The evidence is all there. Sleepaway Camp did amazing box office because the story goes, the ending was such a major shocker that it created that kind of you've got to see this fucking ending vibe. It became this real must-see movie and I think that a lot of that is because the people that were saying that you had to see Sleepaway Camp were not people that would ever really call themselves horror fans as such. Nah, I mean, just think of the horror fans of the period. They were too busy saying that John Carpenter's The Thing was a load of shite, and off-ripping Halloween 3 a new one because Michael Myers wasn't in it. People always say that, oh, the 80s was a great time to be a horror fan, but the sad truth is, then, like now, most horror fans are just a bunch of miserable fucks who don't get enthusiastic about stuff in the same way that that normie crowd does. Sleepaway Camp wouldn't have been a big hit if it was one of those films like um, uh, maybe Maniac or something that was that was the sort of stuff that horror fans were supposedly getting boners over because it was just well bloody and hardcore and nasty. Films like that were just never going to do that kind of big money in the way that something with more of a crowd-pleasing edge to it like Sleepaway Camp had. Your average teen audience was going to the movies for a good time, not to sit there saying, oh, the makeup effects are shy and I, well, we've all seen that ending before in William Castle's Homicidal and Deadly Blessing and Unhinged. They were there to enjoy themselves, and for a film pitched at a younger audience full of really perverted, transgressive stuff, Sleepaway Camp was a movie that just really worked. Why was that? Because it was such a well-made film that actually knew what he was trying to do, which was to make this kind of stealth horror film that started off as one thing, before slowly morphing into something more like what we now think of as a slasher film. 
I think that if you come to sleep waking up expecting a slasher film, then you're going to get stuck with an awful lot of filler. And I think that's what hit me and that's what threw me off. Partly it's that danger of going into any film with the words, this is meant to be a classic in the back of your mind. And partly the fact that as a slasher film, it's not the slasheriest of slasher films. Now, I mean, that's not a problem in itself. As we all know, Halloween doesn't have the highest body count, but it's still the best slasher film of all time, and it always will be. The problem is that Halloween is 100% focused on doing what it does, and almost every single frame of Halloween is horror through and through. But Sleepaway Camp is kind of more like a balanced diet, and for my and my own kind of personal issue with it, the thing that kind of doesn't work for me is that the teen comedy stuff in it is stuff that I wouldn't ever watch if I wasn't watching a horror film, because that's just not really a genre that I'm into. It's the equivalent of going for a big fuck-off McDonald's burger, and if Halloween is the triple-decker, all the trimmings option, then Sleepaway Camp is, to me, something more like being given a smaller burger and a load of lettuce. It's the equivalent of being made to eat your greens for your own good so that you can get to the fun stuff later on. It might ultimately be better for you in the long run, because it means you'll, that you'll appreciate the better stuff when you get to it, but sometimes you just really want that big nasty burger and to just shove all your salad in the bin. There's just that element of it really going hard into the teen stuff that I think kind of dilutes its potential as a horror film. Because, and here's the biggest thing though, Sleepaway Camp does have all the components of a classic slasher, including some of the meanest, nastiest kills of any film of the period, some of which really just kind of make you wince, and not even just in a visually graphic kind of look at that awesome Tom Savini effect kind of way. There's a lot of fucked up shit in Sleepaway Camp, and not all of it is Angela herself. But crucially, and here's the thing, and it's taken me a lot longer than I thought to actually get right down to this, and that is that Sleepaway Camp is amazing because of Felissa Rose's performance as Angela, and it's really that central performance that's what makes it all come together. Angela is this really shy, largely mute girl who's been taken away from home and thrust into seemingly the most awful camp in the world, and left to basically fend for herself with only a brother Ricky to turn to for help, and even he isn't really around because summer camp is a kind of boys over there, girls over here type of deal. The thing that's so important is that whilst most of the other characters feel like pretty fun kind of teen movie archetypes, Angela is a character that's really quite special, and it's almost impossible to watch Sleepaway Camp and not to feel deeply protective of and sympathetic towards her. She seems so much more vivid and interesting than a lot of the other characters, to be honest, so much so that I almost feel like it's a mistake to not have almost the entire film shown to us from Angela's point of view, although I obviously know why they don't do that because I think that a lot of the bits where it feels kind of less focused and more loosey-goosey are when Angela is off-screen. This film should be all about her, but there's large sections of Sleepaway Camp that are just the other characters arsing around, and I think that this is my first legitimate beef with the film in general. The other characters are either horribly grotesque exaggerations of just really horrible people, or else fun, lively teen stereotypes, but none of them do I ever really care about as much as I care about Angela. Although I will say that Desiree Gold as Aunt Martha is, without doubt, the movie's greatest secret weapon because she is batshit crazy in all the right ways and gives one of those performances that really just makes you drop everything and sit up and take notice. She's a dialed up to 11 psychopath in a silly hat and is one of the special ingredients that gets added to a film like this that really sticks in your mind and it should, by rights, be a terrible bit of overacting but somehow it just kind of clicks and it all works in that really special, quite hard to explain away, 1980s way. I mean, there are things about Sleepaway Camp that really do punch above their weight. There is nothing worse than just being a slasher film or a teen movie. You want to really stand out, and to Sleepaway Camp's credit, it does have this rep as being one that really stands out from the crowd. My worry was that it was going to be based on that famous ending scene that I'm not going to spoil here, but which is probably a lot more famous than the film itself. I certainly have always thought of it as the film with that ending, and I've never even seen it before now. But it does have more going for it than being a generic slasher film with a shock ending, even though to some extent that's always how it's going to be remembered in the history books. I think it's got a really interesting feel that is totally unique. It doesn't always click with me personally, but it's got that genuine, and the only time that I'll ever say this is to describe the real thing, not just any old shit that's a bit weird but it is one of those movies that you can describe as being a genuine cult movie, because it's got this fan following that I think is a lot greater than it objectively deserves, and a lot of that I'm sure comes down to people's memories of it as being something that's shocking and transgressive, and something that for a short while became this genuine kind of little phenomenon, this totally unique and personal little passion project that was instantly embraced by audiences and given a special place in their hearts. 
Now that's a very special thing, and I can never hope to say anything that would ever shake it from that place. And what's more, I wouldn't ever want to. Because sleepaway camp might not work for me personally, but it has worked for a load of people. And a less pretentious film than sleepaway camp, you could not hope to find. I really love where it comes from, and I think that one of the things that I enjoyed about this film, even more so than actually watching the film itself, was getting a chance to listen to the commentary and watching the making of documentary, where you realise that this movie means so very much to the people involved with it, that in a way, it kind of immortalised the childhoods of a lot of the kids that were actually filming it. And that is a very special thing to capture, that little slice of history that will forever be there for these people. I mean, you do not hear people saying things like that about any old piece of shit movie, believe me. And the sight of Felicia Rose almost in tears as she remembers how happy she was making it all, well, it really is impossible to sniff at a film that means that much to anyone, isn't it? I know it's like this little cheesy horror movie, but it was like, you know, it was my little dream that came true and it afforded me a lot of things in life. But the weird thing is that Phyllis Rose did basically vanish from acting for some time after Sleepaway Camp, where it looked like she just wasn't going to ever make the jump to being a full-scale adult actress. It was actually a Sleepaway Camp reunion that persuaded her to get back to acting nearly 20 years after this, although the project that would go on to be made as Return to Sleepaway Camp took a very long time to be released, meaning that Phyllis Rose's next film was going to be something very different and very weird. But we will get to that later on. I believe that I've forgotten something. Now what can it be? I think that, well, the plan was to throw in a rating at the end, but I think that Sleepaway Camp is quite a difficult one to rate because it's really one of those rare films that is bigger than just what's on screen. Crucially for us here today is also the film that gave the world Felissa Rose, and probably the coolest thing of all is that Felissa Rose is totally somebody that seems to love this, and she knows that, to most of the world, she will always be Felissa Rose from Sleepaway Camp, and that is pretty amazing to be honest. I mean, she just seems like one of the nicest, most grounded people in the whole horror biz right now, and without Sleepaway Camp, she just wouldn't be making movies simple as that. Sleepaway Camp's a weird little film, it is full of rough edges, it's a little bit weird, it's a little bit pervy in all the wrong ways to be honest with this really kind of nasty streak. It's very unique, Um, it's very much this kind of scrappy little underdog that made it big, and remember that even though nowadays we do think of it as a classic and approach it with this kind of reverence, it's basically this low budget quirky little film that never once bends itself out of its way to make itself popular, it just became popular because people loved it, even in spite of how kind of perverted and scuzzy a lot of it is, because there's things in it that you'd have never gotten away with in a bigger, more populist film of the time, and in its own way, that is the greatest testament to its success of all, the fact that it smashed it at the box office and became this race memory for a generation of 80s kids, and no shitty little internet reviews will ever take that away from Sleepaway Camp, believe me. So yeah, I am going to wriggle out of giving Sleepaway Camp a rating, just because I think it's the sort of film that's worth more than just a simple number that gets filed under the movies to see before you die list, just because it's such a weird, unique little thing. If you haven't seen Sleepaway Camp, then I would definitely say give it a go, because it's a film that works for an awful lot of people, and maybe it'll work for you too, but you definitely should give it a chance. Instead of a rating, what I want to do is this. My plan is, as we go along, I will be giving each of these films a rating out of 10 for how much I enjoy them, but I also want to do something else, which is to give it another rating, which I am going to call the Felissa Factor. Now, the idea with the Felissa Factor is that this is a number that reflects two things. Number one, how important is Felissa Rose herself to the film in question, because bear in mind that not all of the 31 films that I'm going to be talking about this month will actually feature Felissa Rose in a starring role, but it will also go towards determining how important the film in question is to Felissa Rose's career in general, the idea being that the higher a film's Felissa factor, the more Felissa you'll be getting for your money, with the highest scores being devoted to the most important movies in Felissa Rose's filmography, and the ones that really kind of stand out and mark important points in her career. So, for example, a film where she stands in the background for five seconds with no dialogue would get a Felissa factor of 0.5 out of 10, whereas a film with Felissa Rose in every single scene would net itself a 10 out of 10. Get the idea? Pointless, I know, but it is just a bit of fun, because after all, this is the 31 days of Felissa Rose. Got that? Good. 
so of course I'm going to give Sleepaway Camp a Felissa factor of 8.5 out of 10, losing just that point and a half because Felissa Rose is not in probably just under about half of Sleepaway Camp's running time, even though she is the main character and the one who both drives a lot of the action and who the whole film basically revolves around. In terms of her character overall though, there's no more important film for Felissa Rose than Sleepaway Camp the one that started it all, and the one that made her the horror icon that she is to this day. And that is a pretty magical thing, isn't it? So I guess that will probably wrap things up for today. This will probably be about as long as these videos get, just because I think that Sleepaway Camp is a film that deserves a lot more discussion than maybe some of these other films, but you never know. We'll just have to wait and see. I hope that you've enjoyed this rambling little chat about this, the first of the 31 days of Felissa Rose, 1983's Sleepaway Camp. Thanks very much for watching, and if you've got any Felissa Rose horror films that you desperately want me to cover this month, please let me know in the comments, and I'll do my best to review it by the end of the month. Although, please bear in mind that I am working my way chronologically through a filmography, so if I have passed a movie's year of production, then that probably means that I'm not going to be covering it, to be honest. Anyway, please consider subscribing if you've not done so already and that would be a great help. I will hopefully see you back here tomorrow with day number two of the 31 Days of Felicia Rose. I hope that we'll see you there. All right.